This video is sponsored by NordPass. So, after, I guess, a while now, uh, the long-awaited tier list that all of five people have been asking me to make, I finally made. There was a whole lot that went into the armor tier list. I'm going to go through the whole thing. Um, in setting out to create this, my hope is, is that Pestily will end up making one. I'm sure that he will. I really am just going to be interested in comparing notes. Uh, of course, this is the tier list that Pestily is kind of notorious for, while all of the tier lists, really, that's been his shtick. But, you know, I'm a big boy, and my opinion matters, or whatever. But before we get into it, got to pay the bills. So we're going to run the promo, and then after that's over, remember, chapter lists, boys, chapter lists. Once that's over, we'll get into the, uh, the nitty-gritty of it. In the meantime, here's your tier list. You know what I hate getting? Emails that tell me that my password that I had been using in a certain account is no longer valid because it was found to be in a database of stolen passwords. Those kinds of things are things that we genuinely have to worry about now. Ultimately, in my opinion, the best practice here would be to use what is called a password aggregator. The idea being that you only have to remember one master password, and then once you get logged in, there is a list of your passwords only visible to you, backed up by extremely good encryption, and has things like two-factor authentication to allow you to securely access your passwords to log into your websites, and because they get randomly generated, maybe 26 characters long, let's say, you have the ability to log into those sites and not need to worry about somebody else stealing your stuff. NordPass is a password generator that allows you to generate passwords from anywhere from 8 to 60 different characters using capital letters if you want, numbers if you want, symbols if you want, and then you hit generate and there's your alphanumeric password, more or less securing you from ever having anybody steal that. But if they do, NordPass offers extra backup. What they do is they regularly scan the websites that you have passwords in against other databases of people doing malicious stuff to check and see if that password has been stolen and if you need to change it. The thing that I actually love the most about this is the simple onboarding. This getting started feature allows you to add your first password either by doing it manually or importing them. And once imported has an autofill feature that automatically fills in your passwords on all of your favorite browsers. This is a fantastic, fantastic tool that I have added to my security arsenal here at my home base. If you guys go to nordpass.com or click the link in the description below or use code OnePeg on checkout, you will get 50% off plus a free additional month, which means that the cost of NordPass is $2.49 per month. For the cost of $2.49 to know that I would very, very, very not likely end up seeing another stolen password ever again, I would pay 10 times that. Thank you very much to the folks over at NordPass for giving me this opportunity. I very, very greatly appreciate it. So like I said, there's a lot of things to consider when making a tier list like this one. And for those of you wondering, I obviously use the website TierMaker for all the things that I, uh, that I made here. So in considering things, in no particular order, these are the criteria that I wanted to grade the armor by. First is weight. In my opinion, 12.12 .12 has introduced a lot of important considerations when designing a loadout for a PMC when it comes to armor. Never before has weight, especially now with the inertia system, mattered more than it does right now. Depending on your strength level, your mileage might vary, but my character right now is kind of in the middle. It's like in its adolescence of strength leveling. I have around 20 strength, which means I'm getting an extra couple of kilograms of weight. It's 0.1 kilos per point. Before I start hitting that yellow zone, and well, while the firearms in Tarkov can be quite heavy, right now the heaviest aspect of anyone's loadout is likely going to be the armor that they have on. Personally, when I go into a raid, I try to make sure that my loadout's in the green, or it would be in the green if I drop my backpack on the ground. This is for the one simple reason that if I'm in the green, I can crab walk quietly and not give away my position. And I prefer to have every advantage available to me that I can get should I decide to engage someone. Now keep in mind, there's a lot of different armors on this list. There's 41 different pieces here, and they won't likely, or a lot of them will not likely be viable to use until your PMC's maxed out on strength because of the 51 strength perk but that's a conversation for another time. Second is mobility. I don't put as much emphasis on this one, but some of the bulkier armors are going to cut down pretty significantly on your mouse DPI for turning speed and general movement overall. So this one obviously matters. Third is armor class. When grading armor, likely the very first thing that people look at, whether they're gonna wear it or not, is what tier is the armor? Three, four, five, six. The higher the armor's classification, the better armor is at stopping a projectile. Fourth is armor materials. Just like in the real world, the armor in Tarkov is made up of different stuff, and they all have their own different properties. Not all materials are created equal. Some are heavier, some break down faster, some are more or less expensive to repair, and some repair very well, while others are rat awful to try and fix. 
I'm looking at you, Ceramic. Fifth is accessibility. How easily are we able to obtain the armor? Is it barter only? Is it only going to be dropped in a raid? Am I only going to find it in stashes? Is this something that I can buy on the flea market? And then lastly are zones of protection. I actually look at this more of a burden than a boon. Things like arms armor and stomach armor that are available on some of the larger, more bulky armor sets are actually, in my opinion, a deterrent to buying them. Reason why is because right now the armors in the game are not as zonal as they are in the real world. It's either arms, chest, or stomach that gets shot at when people hit these armors, but the durability pool is not based on whether or not it's just an arm or just your chest or just your stomach. It's the entire piece. So to put this a different way, if you got shot in the arm four times and then the chest a fifth time, those four first rounds actually whittled down on your chest's armor ability to stop the bullet from hitting that vital spot. And the chest is where you want the protection to have happened. So in my opinion, chest only armor will forever be best only. Now, I will say that there is a place in here for stomach. Stomach in Tarkov, the stomach zone, when it's blacked out, radiates damage at 130% above, like, whatever the base damage of the round is that hit you. So that extra radiating damage means that someone with 12-gauge magnum buck can one-shot you if all of the pellets hit your stomach because of the bonus damage that it does. That being said, I don't feel as though the vast majority of people are running into shotgun bros shooting you in the stomach constantly. There will be people in the comments, I have no doubt, that will say, I only run Magnum Buck because of this exact reason. And that's fine. If you're the, one of those people that wants to run Magnum Buck, you do you, champ. I'm just saying on a macro level, I don't expect to see the majority of people getting close enough to where all of the pellets of a Magnum Buck round or somebody using a Keter or somebody using flesh damage ammo in a stomach to be the go-to for the vast majority of the player base. I personally can count on one hand this wipe the number of times I have died to stomach damage. It just doesn't happen that much. Anyway, on to the tier list. We're gonna go from the bottom up. At tier F, we have the Zabralo armor, both of the Ospreys, the Reddit Samurai, the Gen 4 Full, the purple Paka, the normal Paka, the 6B2, otherwise known as the poor man's slick, both of the ceramic tier 4 armors, the Tarbank 3M, and the Karasa. Now, I went back and forth on whether or not I was going to put the Karasa on tier D or tier F. And ultimately, we ended up settling on F, or I did, because even though it only weighs 7.1 kilograms, which makes it relatively light, and combined materials are uh, kind of middle of the ground, actually kind of toward the, the bottom of the barrel, actually, uh, in terms of breakability, the level 2 Ragman trade is kind of crappy. It's a Magicka coffee, a Tarkola, and a pack of milk. Tarkola is used in a few different barters, but there's much more lucrative barters that you can be using Tarkola on, and I don't see people necessarily wasting it on a Karasa. Even in the early game, I probably would not do that. So in my opinion, even though it is relatively lightweight and combined materials, it's tier 3. And a tier 3 armor is going to be kind of near the bottom anyway because it just doesn't stop stuff. So if I was super early in the game and super low level, then maybe I would end up running a Karasa if I had no other real choice because I was too low level. But for the most part, this isn't going to be something that I'll ever choose and would likely be something that I would just sell or leave to rot on the ground. And then we have the 3M Tarbank armor, the 6B2, and both of the Pacas. Now, they are the lightest material and the most durable material in the game, being Aramid. However, they're all tier 2, and they don't stop anything. Like, air gets through these. So... Uh, the Paka, actually, if I could put that a tier lower, the purple Paka, I mean, I would because the purple color makes it two kilograms heavier than the regular Paka, which doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Now, of course, there's going to be all the Paka bros that are the same people that love to run the Taz, and that's fine. You guys can go on with your bad self, and they'll obviously be left to rot on your corpse because no one's going to loot a Paka in lieu of anything else to sell to a barter vendor. At the same time, that doesn't mean that it's very protective. You died. So... I personally would not be choosing this, which is why it gets to be an F tier item. Now, the same thing goes for the 6B13 and the 6B23 ceramic armors. There's three different kinds. The 6B23 and the 6B13s um, have three different colored patterns between the three of them. Uh, all of them are garbage. They're made of ceramic. They're not very durable, 47 and 55 durability, uh, respectively. Uh, they fall apart. They're good for maybe one raid. And even though they are tier 4 ceramic, they're still going to break. And they're going to break bad. I would not run them. They're heavy. They're very breakable. They do not last. They're not repairable for shit. They're garbage. And now we move on to the bigger stuff. So the Gen 4, the Reddit, 
and the Zabralo armors that are listed here, the Gen 4 Full, the Reddit, uh, and, and the Zabralos, uh, all three of these, while they are rather protective, the Gen 4 and the Reddit both being Tier 5, and then the Zabralo being Tier 6, the Zabralo is 20 kilograms and the most costly for movement, mobility, and ergonomics penalties out of all of them. It's like 27 ergo or something and reduces your movement and turning ability by like 25 and 38%. It's pretty bad. The, the Reddit and the Gen 4 are not far behind. They are barter-only items. They're things that if you loot them, aside from needing the Zabralo for a quest thing, the rest of the time you would probably, if you're going to loot it, wear it out. If you killed a raider or something and you came in like on a zero to hero run, would be something that you would just sell back to a vendor because the coin that you're going to get or the rubles that you're going to get from the vendor in exchange are going to be worth way more than trying to run it in a raid. Then we have the two Ospreys. One of them is tier four and the other one is tier five. Both of these, unfortunately, are very bulky, and they have arms armor, which means that if you get shot in the arm, it's costing you durability, much like the other full sets. In this case, because the uh, the items are most commonly, if not always, obtained off of uh, a boss guard or a raider, they don't get seen all that often. I think I got one killing a, a raider on labs early on in the wipe. Even though they have some storage space, they're just, in my opinion, not worth using. The movement penalties aren't great. Uh, the protection isn't that great. They don't have a whole lot of durability and they kind of just take up space. So in my opinion, they'd be good to just sell back to a vendor again. So in this case, again, not something that I would ever run because of the costs associated with it and the materials that they're made of aren't that great. The tier four is 60 durability and weighs almost 11 kilograms. And the tier five is 55 durability and weighs 12.5 kilograms. So they're heavy, they're bulky, they have a lot of movement penalty, combined materials and aluminum, just not, not good in my opinion. Okay, moving up to D, we have the full body Thor, we have the Juke 3 press armor, we have the Gen 4 assault, the Untar armor, uh, the 6B23 steel body armor, and then the tier four Thor chest. So going from right to left, the tier 4 Thor chest is only 35 durability. It's not really made to take a hit. It's going to take one round and then it's broke. It's also made of combined materials, which makes it a little bit more on the heavy side, and it does weigh 9 kilograms. So it's not very attractive to use. You commonly only really ever find this stuff on scavs. In fact, I'm pretty sure there's no barter for it. The 6B23-1 is made of steel, which makes it very repairable. It's 60 out of 60 durability, but it's only tier 3, which means a lot of stuff is going to get through it. So it's not great, but it's not as bad as using, like, F level stuff. I put the Untar armor in the same place because the Untar armor is made of aluminum. The Untar armor also is relatively repairable. And there is that quest from Peacekeeper to have to kill scabs and stuff wearing the Untar suit, but it's still tier three in aluminum and is kind of garbage. So it goes at D. I don't think it's as bad as an F because it's made of aluminum. It's a little bit more repairable and you still do have some mobility, but again, not something that I would choose. The Gen 4 Assault is kind of the same uh, place as the Gen 4 Full. It doesn't have the skirt on the bottom, so it doesn't have as much durability, but it does offer the same level of protection. It's still tier five, still covers the stomach and arms. So because it doesn't have as much of a movement penalty and it does have a little bit less durability, it goes into the D slot instead of the F slot. Still not something that I would use. Again, if you're killing a raider or something and you end up looting one because you didn't have any other chest armor or it's replacing another piece or whatever and you're gonna fraud something, I would wear this out and sell it to Ragman. The Juke 3 Press is still going to be a D. Uh, this is also a Tier 3, 50 durability, uh, chest and stomach, no arms. But it has uh, a little bit better durability than the Thor. So even though it is only Tier 3, it's got a little bit better durability. It's still kind of garbage. Um, but it is made of poly, which means that it's more durable than the Thor. It would actually tank more damage than the Thor if they were at the same level because of the material it's made out of. But the reason why the Press Armor isn't uh, level F is because it's made of poly, which makes it light and it makes it durable. So if you are shot, the press armor ends up being something you can repair uh, a lot of. It only loses like two and a half percent of its durability. And then we have the Thor armor. So the Thor armor, while it is tier six, is only 55 durability versus the Zabralo, which is 85. But that doesn't mean that it's light. It's 18 kilograms. It has a slightly less movement penalty. It's like 5% less movement or 7% less movement penalty than the Fort. The only reason why this is class D and not class F is because it weighs slightly less and it has a little bit less mobility. Other than that, it's made of the same stuff. Not really worth running. Level C. From left to right, we have the Yule Tan, we have the Reddit M, we have the A18, the Gazelle, the other Yule, the Tier 4 Yule, and the Gen 4 Mobility. The Gen 4 Mobility is 7 GP coins at Ragman level 3, which 
makes it the most accessible of all of the Gen 4s, and it also is the lightest, even though it does offer some decent protection at 65 durability. But it still weighs 16 kilograms. So again, not a very attractive offer. It would probably be something that I would just sell back to Ragman if I had one on when I got out of a raid. Would not likely bring one into a raid with me. And then we have the two Ulay rigs. The first rig, being the camo-colored one, is tier 4 and made of ceramic. Ceramic is heavy and very breakable. However, it is a chest rig, which makes it, in my opinion, a little bit better than not being a chest rig because then you don't have to buy a rig to replace it. Sure, they have a little bit less storage space, but in my opinion, uh, something that kind of is the all-in-one solution, so to speak, tends to be a little bit better than the tiers below it. The tan Yule is made of titanium and is tier 3. However, it's at class C or level C in my opinion because while it is uh, just as durable but one tier less than the ceramic Yule, it is available at level 1 Ragman for cash. So the extra accessibility for somebody that's first starting out in the game under level 5 or level 10, something like this being able to be purchased on cooldown makes it very accessible and therefore gives it a little bit more value in my eyes. Now the Gazelle. There's going to be a lot of people that are going to look at the Gazelle and they're going to say, well, why is it only level C and not higher? There are people that think that the Gazelle is a more of a go-to because you can buy it for cash at Ragman. Yes, you have the ability to buy it for cash, but it is only 65 durability, which means that even though at tier 5, if it takes a couple of high pen rounds, it's broken. Because it's made of ceramic, it breaks very easily and very quickly. And if you go to repair it, if it were zeroed, you would lose about 20-25% of the overall durability of the item. So now you have a tier 5 at only 75% effectiveness, which basically makes it a tier 4 after the first raid. In my opinion, your money would be better spent on something like a Corind, which even though it is slightly less uh, in cost, it's made of better material, and even though it has less durability, if you end up surviving a hit or two, is something that you can repair to full or near full when you get out of a raid because it's made of steel instead. So in my opinion, the Gazelle goes at level C. The A18 Skanda rig at level C is for a few different reasons. Now the A18 can be obtained from Ragman at level 3 for 5 bottles of Jack Daniels whiskey. Or if you finish Living High is Not a Crime Part 2, you can obtain it for a barter at level 4 Ragman for 1 gold skull ring and 3 gold chains. So in my opinion, this comes in at middle of the road because it's tier 4, it has some decent storage, but it only weighs 8 kilograms even though it's made of combined materials, 8.2. So it's on the lighter side of something that would be, I guess, a really large uh, rig to hold a lot of stuff. I don't know if I necessarily would call it a go-to, but I don't think it deserves to be in a lower tier because of all of those things kind of mixed in. And the movement penalty is minimal. It's 6 ergo and like 7% movement. It's really not that bad. Then last but not least, we have the Reddit M. Now the Reddit M is the mobility version of the Reddit T5 where it loses the side skirts on the sides and loses the arms. So you're only looking at chest and stomach protection. So it is a little bit lighter, but it's still 13.5 kilograms and there's no barter for it, which means that the only time that you're going to find one of these is either off the body of a raider or a scav guard or you find it in a stash or, you know, your scav case coming back with one in it. Now, the movement penalty is only 13% and a handful of ergo points, like 10. But in my opinion, this deserves to be middle of the road because even though it is relatively protective and made of combined materials and all of that stuff, uh, in, in my opinion, it doesn't, it doesn't deserve to be uh, lower than where it is, but it doesn't deserve to be higher either. Again, probably something that I would just sell to a vendor if I got one. Okay, now moving into the runner-up of the runner-up, we have level B. So this includes the Strand Hog, the Defender 2, the AVS, the 6B3TM and the Juk 6. So the Juk 6 is made of ceramic. 75 durability, it's 10 points better than the Gazelle and one level of protection higher. That also means because it's ceramic, it's going to be very, very breakable. They protect about the same amount of stuff, but with it being tier 6, it's going to shrug off a little bit more damage on higher pen ammo than it would uh, if you were wearing Gazelle. That being said, you're still subject to the same penalties when it comes to repairing the armor if you end up taking a few hits and it's on the heavier side. Just to give you an idea, the Juke is 9 kilograms, and the Slick Armor, which is made of steel and is incredibly repairable, is only 9.7. The Juke also does not have a barter. So again, the only time that you're going to see one of these is if you pull one off of a Scav Guard or a Raider or a Boss or something along those lines. Or stashes, you know, found in Raid. So for that reason, because it is a Tier 6, I'm putting it at level B. Moving on to the 6B3 TM. Now, in this case, again, this is accessibility coming into play at level B. It's tier 4, it's made of titanium, so it's middle of the road in terms of durability and repairability. But you can buy it for cash from Ragman, and you don't have to be a very high level to do it. 
You also have the ability to, if you're purchasing these and you end up going through and you get them damaged, you can set them to the side and take four damaged ones and trade them back, barter them back to Ragman for a fresh one. Now, that isn't a barter that I think anyone would really end up utilizing because you would probably just get off selling everything back to Ragman and just buying one for cash. But like I said, as a go-to tier four chest rig, this is a very, very useful piece. And much like the other stuff in this category, it weighs about 9 kilograms. So, usable, but not amazing. Next to that, we have the AVS rig. So, the AVS rig, again, is a Tier 4, but the AVS is a little bit different in material makeup. The AVS plate carrier is Tier 4, made of combined materials, and weighs 8.7 kilograms. So, it's a little bit lighter than the titanium version. Now, the level 2 Ragman barter for this at 2 gold neck chains and 2 TT pistols is probably not the most attractive thing in the world. But the Ragman at level 3, a little bit later on in the game for, I think it's 5, five toothpaste and 7 shampoos at Ragman 3, might not be such a bad thing. Those things tend to not get so crazily expensive a little bit later on in the game. The AVS chest rig also offers some of the best storage for chest rigs out of all of them and comes in on the lighter side of things at only 8.7 kilograms. Moving on from there, we have the Defender 2. Now, the Fort Defender 2 is actually a pretty nice piece. It's 70 durability, made of steel, which means it's the most repairable material in the game, and even though it's chest and stomach only, weighs 11.5 kilograms, but for that 11.5 kilograms, doesn't have super bad movement penalties. It's like 9% movement or something. Now, you compare that to the Zabralo armor that's Tier 6, at 85 durability, with arms on top of it having a 37% movement penalty, and the Defender 2 actually comes in pretty good at level B. The only real drawback to this is that it doesn't have a barter, which again is one of those things that you're going to end up having to pull off of like Gluhar or something when you go and attack them. So the likelihood of getting one completely unscuffed is pretty unrealistic, but it is made of steel, very repairable, which makes it very good on the surface. And then last but certainly not least, we have the Strandhog. Strandhog is 45 durability, came in with the Christmas event, and is made of aluminum. Because it's made of aluminum, it only weighs in at 6.5 kilos, which makes it extremely light and extremely viable in that sense. But again, it is only tier 4. It does have a barter for a sewing kit and two core dura at Ragman level 3, but unfortunately it is not available on the flea market. So it does get a little bit of a hitch in its step there. Because of its relatively low durability, the Strand Hog, and, and because it's made of aluminum, it is a little bit more breakable than some of the other materials. For those reasons, uh, the lower durability and the breakability of it, I'm putting it at level B. Although it could very well be a low A, in my opinion. Kind of struggled with that one a little bit. Okay, now we go to level A. Level A is the TV-110 rig, the Slick, the Corind, and the M1 and M2 rigs. Now the M1 and the M2, the M1 is steel and the M2 is titanium, are both very, very accessible. You can buy them both on the flea market. They're available both on the flea market. They're both tier 4. They have decent durability at 60 and 65 each. The M1 is 7 kilograms. The M2 is 9 kilograms, so very usable. They don't have a lot of movement penalties. They're like 10% movement penalty. The M1 is a really, really easy trade because it's four Aquamari bottles that you end up getting from like everywhere and you can drink down the Aquamari down to a single point and still be able to use it for the barter. And one one Kavas. So it's four Aquamari and a Kavas. Really, really cheap, easy trade. And then the M2 rig is three round frame sunglasses and three coal pack visors at level three Ragman. Or at level four, it's for 10 level 20 dog tags, which as you get relatively late in the game, there's not a whole lot of dog tag barters for armor so that's a very, very good one to be able to utilize. So I like these two at the A level because they have good storage. They're relatively inexpensive to barter for. They have good mobility. They're made of good material. You know, they're, they're kind of like a good package. From here, we have the Corind. Now, there are people that I've talked to even recently that have said that they like the Corind less than they like the Gazelle. They feel like the Gazelle should be over the Corind. But here's the thing. The Corind's good for about two hits of high pen ammo. The Gazelle's good for about two hits of high pen ammo. Realistically speaking, they're about the same level in terms of both their protection and how long they're going to be able to last durability-wise. The main difference here is that the Gazelle is not repairable. It loses 23% of the repair value if you are able to repair it. The Corind gets back like 98%, 97% of its repairability when you repair it because it's made of steel which is the most repairable material in the entire game. So in my opinion, buying a Corind every time over a Gazelle is the go-to. If that's not evidence enough, you can just look and see which one gets looted more often off of a corpse. And in my experience, that's been the Corind. And then we have likely the most contentious item on this entire list, and that's going to be the Slick. 
So the Slick is Tier 6. It's made of steel. It's incredibly repairable, but it's also incredibly expensive to insure. It costs 100,000 rubles, give or take, to insure a Slick. It's also a little bit on the heavier side. It weighs 9.7 kilograms. So it is not as light as it once was. It's been nerfed a couple of times in its weight where BSG has tacked on a couple of extra kilos. And the barter for it isn't all that cheap either. It's three troopers, four Cordura, and four Aramid cloth to Ragman level four. And since 12.12 .12 came out, it's no longer marketable on the flea. So the only way that you're realistically getting one is from a stash or you're going to end up bartering for it. I'm going to guess that the barter is really the only way that you're going to grab it because stash ones just don't get found all that often. And then last but certainly not least on the A-level list is the TV-110 rig. Now, once upon a time, the TV-110 and the AVS until November 2019 were both Tier 3 rigs. That got changed to Tier 4 two and a half years ago. Now, it does weigh 10 kilograms, but it offers a lot of storage space, and it's also made of steel as well, which means it's incredibly repairable. And the barter for it is pretty cheap. It's four bleach and two shampoo, which makes it very, very, very easily obtained. If you're going to go on a loot run, this is probably the go-to for the loot run because of the storage capacity, the fact that it's tier four, it's uh, made of steel, it's got good protection, it's got good durability. And, you know, if you're going to go rappelling down the cliff, like if you got a, a Red Rebel extract on reserve, for instance, you don't have to worry about ditching your body armor or stuffing it in a backpack in order to be able to get out. And now we have the All-Stars, the S tier. We have the Hex Grid, the Tac Tech, Killa's Body Armor, the CPC Mod 2, the M Mac, the AVS MBAV, Tagilla's Chest Armor, and the Tier 4 Trooper. Now, the Hex Grid is one of the lightest armors in the entire game. It's only 7.7 .7 kilograms, and it's made of poly, which means it's incredibly repairable, it's incredibly durable, and even though it's only 50 durability because it covers chest armor only, chest only, I find that to be a boon rather than it being a burden. Unfortunately, this is one of those ones that's going to end up coming off of scav bosses, scav guards, and inside of, of stashes and the like. So you're not going to see it all that often, but when you do find it, it's one of those things that you tend to hold on to and run when you're going to run a pretty big thick boy kit. So for that reason, and the, the small movement penalties, I put it at an S. Next is the Tac Tech rig. The Tac Tech rig, along with the TV 110 and the AVS rig, once upon a time, was also only tier four. And then the Tac Tech got upgraded in November of 2019 to tier five, which automatically punched it up into the stratosphere. One of the common themes that you're going to see with the S tier armors is that they're all made, or most of them are made of poly. The Tac Tech rig is made of poly as well. It has 50 durability, tier five, chest only. Really, really, really good go to rig. It has a barter at Ragman for five GP5 gas masks and six neoprene masks, which makes it relatively easy to obtain because you can just buy those off of the flea. And even though it comes in at 9.5 kilograms, it only has a 7% movement penalty. So because of its ease of access and the ability for you to run it and not have much of a movement penalty and still get halfway decent protection and it being chest only, I find that to be an S. Third, we have Killa's armor. Killa's chest armor and stu well, Killa's chest and stomach armor is likely the best overall armor in the entire game. Now, obviously, you have to be able to obtain it, so killing somebody else or killing Killa and getting that armor off of him is going to be a job. But this has traditionally been one of the major go-tos. It's tier five and covers chest and stomach, but only weighs 7.5 kilograms, which makes it extremely, extremely valuable. One of those ones that you grab it and you hold on to it if you can. Next, we have the CPC Mod 2. The CPC Mod 2 is 50 durability, tier 5, and only weighs 8.5 kilograms with a movement penalty of like 6%. It's actually pretty rockin'. It has a barter from Ragman level 4 after you complete the task Long Line for 4 Corridora, 4 Ripstop, and 1 bottle of Jack Daniels. It has really great storage, again, really good protection, kind of like an all-in-one bundle, and since it's made of poly, it's durable and it's repairable. Same thing with the M-Mac. Now, the M-Mac is only Tier 4, and it only has 40 durability, but it's made of poly, which makes it, again, light, durable, repairable. It only weighs 7.2 kilograms, which makes it extremely mobile. And it's available at Ragman Level 2 for one ripstop cloth and one sewing kit. Second to last, we have the ABS MBAV. Now, this is Tagilla's chest armor piece. If you didn't know, it's the only Tier 6 chest armor in the game. It's titanium. It's light. It's only 7.8 kilograms compared to Killa's armor, which is 7.5. So you're talking like 0.3 kilos to be able to run around with a Tier 6 chest-only item that has a bunch of 1x3 slots in it because he likes to use the 10-round Saiga mags. It also has a very, very minimal movement penalty at like 6%, so this is a strong, strong go-to. And last but certainly not least is the Tier 4 Trooper. 
that I list at S. This also might be one that people are scratching their head at, but hear me out. The Trooper armor is made of poly, which makes it extremely light, extremely durable, and extremely repairable. But the thing that tends to separate the Trooper armor from most of this list is it joins the ranks of very, very few armors that are still available on the flea market that aren't complete garbage. So the Trooper being tier 4, but being available on the flea makes it something that, well, it's mid-grade, has a lot more viability in this current, I guess, metagame of Tarkov at 12.12 than what it was before, because high-pen ammo isn't as accessible as it once was, which means people need to be much more accurate, and armor is a lot more valuable than it was before. So because the Trooper is still purchasable on the flea, it only costs between like 100 to 130k, makes it very affordable. So a 100k item that will likely end up coming back in insurance, that likely ends up being very repairable. It's something that you can bring from raid to raid to raid because it's only losing a couple of percentage points every time that you repair it. Very good piece of armor. Really the thing that puts this at the S tier is the ability to be able to buy it on the market. The market purchasability of the trooper armor is really the thing that sets it apart. If it wasn't for the ability to buy it on the market, I would probably move it down to an A, maybe even a B but it's, it's because of the market accessibility and having as high of a durability as it does. That's actually the one armor on this list that I feel as though Nikita might end up taking away from us, if I'm being honest. Anyway, guys, that's what I have for this video. I hope you guys enjoyed this, enjoyed my thought process. I look forward to the comments and contention or support thereof. And uh, once again, you know, when Pestily makes his, I look forward to comparing notes. So thanks for coming by, boys. We'll see you in the next one. Peace.